and that. So guys, in order to get started as advertised, we are going to skip through chapter seven. We're gonna do this as a Q&A format. If you have questions, you need to ask them. But guys, the important thing that you've got to understand is that everything we know about periodic trends all build off of one central premise, which is the interplay of nuclear strength and shielding, which you may understand ties us back to PES, right? Did you just do that in your brain? No? Should we do it again? So guys, remember the idea with PES. Here we've got the nucleus, here we've got the electrons, and PES allows us to measure how much energy it takes to get the electrons out of atoms, right? But the idea is that the amount of energy it takes to eject an electron is the interplay between the strength of the nucleus and the amount of shielding. Does that all make sense? We call it ionization energy. Well, guys, that all has to tie back then to this idea of the periodic trends because, you, oh, my periodic table is down here. I don't need a laser. Because, guys, you may remember that we talked about the idea that as we go down groups and as we go across periods, there are trends to the atomic radius, to the electronegativity, to the ionization energy, all those things that we need to understand about atoms so that we can predict the way they're gonna behave. You remembering all of that stuff? Let's go through it. So guys, again, please ask questions if you need. So talking about periodic trends, the first one we need to talk about is atomic radius. Any of this that you think you don't know, you definitely wanna write down. So guys, the idea is this. As we go down a group on the periodic table, what happens to the radius? The atoms get bigger. And why do they get bigger as we go down groups? We're adding energy levels to the atoms. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, guys, what about this? When we go left to right across a period, what happens to the size of the atoms? They get smaller. Why do they get smaller? Number of protons in the nucleus, the effective nuclear charge increases. But now you're going, wait a minute, I understand that I'm adding protons to the nucleus, but I'm also adding electrons. So why do the atoms get smaller and not bigger if we are adding electrons as we go across a, as across a period? The, the attraction to the nucleus is stronger, that's true, but we're still adding electrons. Guys, the important point is, where are we adding electrons? To the same energy level. Does that make sense? As we go across, we're adding electrons to the 3s and the 3p, so they're functionally in the same energy level, and as the nucleus gets stronger, it pulls the whole thing tighter together. As we go down a group, we are still adding electrons, but we're adding them to successively larger energy levels. Does that make sense? Okay. Down a group. Down a group bigger. Down the side. Small. Across. But guys, be careful. Down is directional, right? Across is not directional. So when we say across, what do we need to say to understand the trend? From left to right. So as we go left to right across a period, what happens to the size of the atoms? They get smaller. Okay. So this then is the trend. <laughs> Down a group. The radius increases as energy levels are added. Across a period, left to right, the radius decreases uh, due to an increased charge of the nucleus. We call that the effective nuclear charge. And therefore, guys, we have this trend, which I lifted out of the text, out of chapter 7. So guys, where are the smallest elements on the periodic table? Top right. The biggest elements, bottom left. So guys, you done writing down what you think you need to write down so you have everything written down that you need to write down? I just couldn't resist saying that. You guys okay? You guys good? Okay. So then guys, from there, once we understand this trend in atomic radius, we now need to talk about the real stuff that we need to understand. So why do we talk about atomic radius to begin with? And the answer is because size has a lot to do with the way these elements interact, the way they bond to other elements. 
So guys, this comes down to electronegativity and then ionization energy. Some of you right now are having flashbacks to that magic moment when I showed you my electronegativity animation last year. Do you remember? I'm going to show it to you again. I know. I know. It was, it was meaningful. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was, oh, yeah. All right. So, guys, what is electronegativity? We think of it as stealing power. Don't ever say that. But guys, electronegativity is a measure of an atom's attraction for electrons from other atoms. Why is that valuable to us? Well, guys, that's what predicts how atoms bond with other atoms, because when atoms get together to bond, what they're really doing is pulling on each other's electrons. And the way that that plays out in any particular combination of atoms depends upon their relative ability to pull on electrons. So, uh, is, I, I, well, so you guys understand that the electronegativities are all on the periodic table, right? So you can actually look these up on the periodic table. But the thing that's interesting, guys, they're here in the upper right-hand corner of our good periodic tables. But you'll notice that these numbers don't have units. Uh, there are several different ways to calculate electronegativities. These are what, this was Linus Pauling's idea of how to do it. Um, but guys, understand these are dimensionless numbers. They are only valuable comparatively. But that's how we use them, is comparatively. So let's talk about the trends on the periodic table for electronegativity. So guys, in order to know the trends for electronegativity, you need to be able to connect this back to size. So do you remember the deal? Which elements are strong, the big ones or the little ones? Little ones. So guys, if you remember that small is strong, then as we go down a group, they get bigger or smaller? Bigger, therefore they get weaker or stronger? Weaker, and then as we go left to right, they get bigger or smaller? Smaller, and, and remember when we say big or small, we mean radius. So guys, as we go left to right, they get smaller, therefore they get stronger. So guys, it goes like this. Down a group, the electronegativity decreases because of increased shielding. And again, we know that shielding is the interference caused by these inner core electrons. And then across the period, the electronegativity increases due to an increased nuclear charge and decreased shielding because the atoms are getting smaller and the trend goes like this. You good? So guys, where are then the strongest elements on the periodic table? The upper right. But we also understand that it is not hydrogen and helium. Why not? They're full. They don't have a place to put electrons. They can't steal because they have nowhere to put them. So the most electronegative element on the periodic table we understand to be fluorine. Yeah? Where at? Oh, these guys? I don't even, oh, so what does that even mean? It means they have unusually high electronegativities, and we're down in this area, I guess. Is that right? Gold through like sort of ruthenium down in here? I don't know. Um, I have no idea why. I mean, are they really that disproportionate? So electronegativities are top right. I mean, they're not that out of line because it goes 1.1, 1.3, 1.5. Here's a big jump. It goes up to 2.4, then back down to 1.9. Does it? Wait, am I looking at the right numbers? Yeah. That's crazy. Tungsten's off the charts. It doesn't even have tungsten right. Um, so then it goes back down. So that's anomalous, but it's anomalous here too. I really don't know. I'm not sure. That's cool. I don't know. Um, but we do understand the trend holds. Yeah, and to be honest with you, this is interesting. So um, Jake was pointing out that we've got some weirdness going on down here in the D sublevel. But frankly, I've never thought about it before. 
And the reason that I haven't is because we are not going to talk about the bonding of, of metals, right? We don't deal a whole lot with these metals anyway, but even if we did, we would think of them as being cations and salts and not anions and molecules. So it's never really come up because these metals, we just understand metals bond ionically with anions and we don't really worry about it. But there is, I guess, the possibility that these metals down here exactly could have strong enough electronegativities that they could form molecules. That's cool. I had no idea. Yeah, I had never noticed that. That's interesting. But I, I mean, because we've got things that are on the order of the bottom twos, and nitrogen is right in that area. So you could form metal nitrides with those. I had no idea. That's cool. I don't know. Yeah, that's fun. So guys, you okay with the trend on electronegativity? You understand electronegativity? Because that means we can skip the animation, right? You really want to see it. All right. Yeah, so the, so, and I'm going to show you this animation that I came up for my general chemistry students and sort of descriptively the way that this thing is set up. Let me just show you. The way that it's set up is we talk about two different atoms pulling on the same electron, but really what we're talking about is not atoms trying to steal an electron that's free in space. What we're talking about is the relative poles of two atoms as they're coming together to bond. Understand that's the limitation of this animation, but I didn't want to try to put the electron between them just because it would be confusing. So do you guys remember this? Okay, so I understand now that this is not only unnecessary, but also as Jake just pointed out, technically incorrect because electronegativity is in fact a relative pole that two atoms have for a similar electron as they're fighting over them, trying to bond covalently, ionically, and so on. But the purpose of this was to demonstrate or to show you the difference between uh, uh, effective nuclear charge and shielding, and then the idea that small atoms are stronger. So this is the way this played out last year teaching you about electronegativity. I said, hey, yo, here's a hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom's got one proton. As a result, it doesn't have a very strong, effective nuclear charge reaching out, reaching out to the electron and pulling it back. But we understand that this electron is, in fact, being drawn near this atom because of the, the positive charge of the nucleus. But then we also have this one electron that is repelling that other electron. What do we call that repulsion? That would be shielding. Then I brought in a potassium atom, element number 19. And we said, oh my gosh, 19 protons, all of this effective nuclear charge drawing that electron in. But now we've got 19 electrons going, uh-uh, you can't come over here. And then we ask the question, which one is in a better electron taker inner, a weak nucleus with limited shielding or a strong nucleus with excessive shielding? Which one wins? Not potassium, the small one. And then remember, we knew that it won because it sparkled. And that would then be the idea that small atoms with weaker nuclei are better electron taker inners because it really comes down to shielding. The larger and more complex an atom is, yes, the stronger the nucleus will be, but it also has increased shielding, which makes the overall electron affinity lower. So that means small atoms are stronger. Is that all coming back to you? You okay? All right. So now, guys, we need to talk ionization energy. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I'm going to answer that because we're going to talk about that today. 
Um, yes. So, and guys, we're going to talk about this in a minute. So you understand that the end game would be that electron would be drawn into the hydrogen atom, and that would be an exothermic process that would release energy. We're going to talk about that more in a minute, because if you think about it, that's what happens when salts form, right? So sodium loses an electron. Where does it go? It falls into chlorine. When it falls into chlorine, it releases energy in the form of light. Yeah, we're going to talk. Okay. Ionization energy, guys, that was an afterthought when we did this last year in general chemistry. But because you've done PES, you should have a really good sense of, of ionization energy. Let's talk about it briefly. So guys, ionization energy is the amount of energy needed to strip an electron from the atom. You understand that we think about that as promoting the electron to which energy level? Energy level infinity and at that point we say the electron has been stripped from the atom but we think of this as keeping power the more energy that it takes to strip that electron the better hold the atom has over its electrons so what then are the trends on the periodic table and guys you may remember the same thing that makes atoms good stealers electronegativity the same thing that makes them good stealers makes them good keepers. And so the trend for ionization energy is the same as the trend for electronegativity. Do you remember that? Okay. So again, the idea is as we go down a group, ionization energy decreases because of increased shielding. Across a period, ionization energy increases because the nucleus is strong. Shielding goes down because the atom is smaller and it looks like this. And now you'll notice, guys, that the noble gases are on the graph. For electronegativity, we didn't include the noble gases. Again, because they can't take in electrons. They can't steal. They're full. But oh boy, they sure can hang on to the electrons they've got. So the noble gases are thought to not have uh, electronegativities, but they definitely have ionization energies. So there you got it. No, shielding is the interference of the core electrons. So like, for example, if you take a look at maybe a lithium atom, should let me do this. Um, so if you take a look at a lithium atom, we've got three protons. We've got two electrons in the 1s. We've got one electron in the 2s. These electrons are attracting that electron, but these electrons are pushing out, shielding. Remember, we talked about that relative to PES. So you'd have a spike and then a spike and it's all of that good stuff. Yeah, so ionization energy is the amount of energy it takes to kick out that electron. Uh, because the amount of, so imagine if I've got a book and if you want to pull that book away from me, if it's easy to steal my book, then I'm not very good at keeping the book. So the amount of energy that it takes for you to take something from me is actually a measure of how much energy I can exert to keep it. So the amount of energy that it takes to steal an electron from an atom is really a measure of how good that atom is at holding on to its electrons. Absolutely. It's, it's a measure of the same thing. So electronegativity is an atom's ability to take in electrons. Ionization energy is an atom's ability to hang on to electrons. But it's fundamentally a measure of the same thing because it's still an attraction for electrons. Okay. Understand that that does break apart for the noble gases because the noble gases have fantastically high ionization energies. It's really hard to get electrons away from the noble gases, but they have no electronegativity because they can't take electrons in because there's nowhere they can put them. Right. Does that make sense? Okay. So guys, that's a good time to call time out. We're now done with chapter seven. Anything that you need to review mentally uh, relative to atomic radii, uh, electronegativity, ionization energy, effective nuclear charge, shielding, any of that malarkey. You guys good? You're good? Yo. All right. Chapter eight. Here we go. Dun, dun, dun. Yep. 
here we go. You guys are really good? All right, guys, chapter eight. What we're going to do, again, is we're going to do a overview, if you will, a summary of the three types of bonds that exist. It's not an exhaustive list, um, but the three types that we need to talk about in here, um, ionic, covalent, metallic. We'll go over each one fundamentally. Then, guys, we're going to do a deep dive on ionic bonding today, and then we're going to call it a day at that point. And while I'm thinking of it, um, sorry, just a second. I don't know what time class gets out. Do you guys know? Um, 12.20. Oh, good. We, wow, we have a ton of time. So, guys, we have until 12.20 to uh, skip through this. All right, so here we go. So, guys, first of all, this. If we're going to talk about chemical bonding, we got to figure out what a chemical bond is. The funny part is, I'll bet you'd struggle to define it. So, guys, what is a chemical bond? Okay, so we know it involves one more than one atom. There may be sharing, but it's not just sharing. Now, you can't use the word bond in the definition of a bond. Like a rubber band. Whoa! I'll give it to him. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, nice. Thanks. We got stuff coming from all directions. All right. So, guys, we've got an idea about sharing, which isn't wrong, but isn't complete. But I would say that if we're talking about a generic definition, it's too limiting. And then uh, we have the words on the table, bond, which we can't use to define a bond. And then something about, what did you say, uh, uh, connection. I'm not comfortable with connection. Because guys, when you think connection, and believe me, this isn't your fault, but guys, when you picture bonds, my fear is that you actually picture sticks. There ain't sticks, no sticks. Snatums. So guys, what is a bond? It's not a link, because a link is a stick. It's attraction. Okay, so attraction requires what, all you budding young physicists? Okay, it oh good, okay, so now we know it's an attraction dependent upon charge, but there's a word that we're missing from our physics background. Begins with an F and ends with ORS. Ah! <laughs> Good night. So, guys, now we've got the three components. It is attractive. It is not repulsive. It is an attraction. And that attraction is a force. And that attractive force is the result of opposing charges. So guys, that is our definition of a chemical bond. It is an attractive force that exists between opposing charges. Now, we can use some different words, though. So we're going to go with this. It is a force of attraction that exists between two atoms, which exists when these atoms or ions are strongly attracted coulombically to one another. Now, guys, what does coulombic mean? The result of electric charge. Yeah, right. So we, we have that. 
we have that adverb, right? Strongly. So what does that mean to be strongly attracted? And, and we're going to leave it this vague right now, Brandon. Um, when we talk about strongly attracted, we say that because it leaves us room to talk about weak attractions, which we call intermolecular forces. Because um, what you find out is that bonds are positive and negatives attracting each other to bring things together. So are intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are also attractions between positives and negatives. Um, and again, we, we end up with this weird idea like inside of ice that we think these bonds, these covalent bonds are one kind of stick and then the intermolecular forces are another kind of stick. They're all the same forces. The bonds that hold the hydrogens to the oxygens in water are the exact same forces that exist between the polar water molecules holding each other together as ice, which we call intermolecular forces. They're all just coulombic attractions. So, because some are strong and some are weak. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because, for example, within water, the behavior of ice is not determined by what the covalent bonds are doing. It's determined by what the intermolecular forces are doing. So why does ice melt at zero Celsius? It's not a function of the strength of the covalent bonds. It's a function of the strength of the intermolecular forces. So what you find out is that on a macro scale, and this is the whole next unit, it's crazy, the macro scale behaviors of substances are typically not determined by the strengths of their bonds. It's typically determined by the strengths of their intermolecular forces because those are the things that change first. A chain always breaks at its weakest link, right? And intermolecular forces are weaker than bonds, and those are the things that change and reorganize, which determines how substances behave, how they, how they boil, how they freeze, how they sublimate, all the thing, how they behave as gases. All of those are functions of their intermolecular forces. So we need to say strongly so that it leaves us uh, a little wiggle room to talk about weakly, which are intermolecular forces, which is the whole next unit. Okay, so guys, you ready for the 30 second refresher? Now that we understand what chemical bonds are, you ready? What are the three types? Metallic, ionic, covalent. Ready? What is a metallic bond? So guys, okay, so let's do it this way. So you remember, metals are on the left hand side of the periodic table, right? You remember the, oops, <coughs> let me flip this over. So it goes like so, metals are on the left-hand side of the heavy stair step that goes down through the P sublevel. So these are the metals. Are they big or small? Relatively speaking, they're big, so are they strong or weak? Weak. How many valence electrons do they have? Not many, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They ain't got many. So guys, metals are big, fat, weak atoms without very many valence electrons. You get them together, what do they do with their valence electrons? Dump them into their free space. Those electrons wiggle around. We call that the sea of electrons. And you end up with these positive nuclei being diffusely attracted to this cloud of negative charge. And that's what causes metals to behave the way they do. That's why they're shiny. That's why they're malleable. That's why they're ductile. That's why they conduct electricity. All the things we know about metals. If that didn't make sense, we'll go back over it in a minute. Now, guys, ionic bonds. How does this happen? What two atom pairs form an ionic bond? A metal and a non-metal. What did we just learn about the metals? They are big and weak. What about the non-metals? Small and strong, lean and mean. And guys, when these get together, what does the nonmetal do to the metal? Steals its electron. What does the nonmetal become? Negative ion. What does the metal become? Positive ion. What do negatives and positives do? Boom. Got it? Okay, so now guys, look at what we've done. We've gone metal to metal. We've gone metal to nonmetal. What is the only combination we missed? Non-metal to non-metal. So now we've got two small, strong atoms. When they come together, they start pulling on electrons. Neither one wins, so what do they do? Share. Now, guys, I'm going to plant a little doubt in your head. Sadly, none of you challenged me on this last year, but we need to talk. 
So guys, you have this weird idea in your brain that sharing electrons causes covalent bonding, which is a very strong attraction. That's stupid, right? Because guys, when we get two electrons together, when we share two electrons, what do electrons do to each other? They don't attract, they repel. None of you questioned that last year. But guys, that's the case. When we bring two electrons together and we share them, because we learned that covalent bonding is about sharing, when we share two electrons, that initially does not create attraction. It creates tremendous repulsion. So how does that form a strong bond? We're going to talk about that on Thursday. Okay? So guys, I know, a little foreshadowing. But guys, this then is where we're going to go. Types of bonds, write down what you need. Ionic bonding, you already know this. <clears throat> this is an electrostatic force that exists between ions of opposite charge. These are formed by a metal and a nonmetal bonding together. You understand that when these form, you have stealing that creates ions that attract one another. I would suggest that you already knew all of that and writing it down is unnecessary but you guys are slaves to the note-taking process, and I know better than to try to fight that, so I'm going to give you time to write it down. So the metallic, the metallic bond, is it just the valence electrons that are the MSC, or are we the MSC? It's typically just those, yeah. But guys, here's the trick. You're not done. So this is ionic bonding as far as you know right now. You understand that the, met, the non-metal steals from the metal. This creates ions, which then attract. What you're going to find out, guys, if the story stopped there, salts would not exist. Now, let's be sure you're clear. You guys understand what a salt is, right? What is a salt? It is an ionically bonded substance. Sodium chloride is one salt. But guys, anytime you've got a positive and a negative ion, that is a salt. So, copper 2 sulfate, the stuff we used in lab today, this is salt. The positive ion is copper, the negative ion is sulfate, this is salt. So guys, anytime you've got a positive and a negative ion, be it an element or a polyatomic of either one, it's salt. So guys, here's the deal. If ionic bonds form salts, and if this was the end of the story as far as, as formation goes, salts wouldn't exist. So what's the last step? It's actually the formation of what is called a lattice, and we're going to talk about that today. So guys, I'm not even going to ask for questions because this is an overview of what we're going to do with the rest of today. So let's go over covalent bonding really quickly, understanding that we're going to do a deeper dive on this on Thursday. So covalent bonding, as you now understand, ridiculously results from the sharing of electrons. And we learned about sharing last year, and sharing sounded better, and stealing sounded evil. And if stealing is bad, certainly sharing is good, because you learned that in primary. And as a result, sharing's got to make good bonds, because everybody would rather share, because that doesn't make you a sinner. So, guys, sharing shouldn't create bonds, but it does. So how does it work? Well, guys, we know that this happens when two nonmetals get together. What is it that causes them to share? They're both strong. Neither one wins, so they have to share. But guys, this process actually happens in a multi-step program as well, and it involves something called hybridization. I look forward to teaching this to you. We skipped over it last year. You may remember there was that day last year in class when we drew the Lewis dot structure for carbon, and remember carbon's got two electrons in the S, two in the P, it goes like this. I said, guess what guys, we're not gonna draw carbon like this. We're gonna spread out its electrons as much as possible. Somebody asked why. I said, I'm not gonna tell you till next year. Guys, now it's next year. The reason these electrons spread out of the S and into the P is because of a process called hybridization, which I'll teach you next time in class. It's actually really fascinating. It answers a lot of the questions that you may have had coming out of molecular geometry stuff last year. So we'll get there. Okay, so were you guys done? 
You're okay? All right, so then guys, the last type of bond we need to talk about, and this is all we're gonna do with this. We're not going back to this later. When we're done with this slide, we're done. So hang on, we haven't even started yet. So guys, metallic bonding, metallic bonding guys is a delocalized, I like that word, it's a delocalized bond that exists between metal atoms. And I don't like the way I constructed this sentence. But guys, metal atoms have low electronegativities. Maybe that's a better way to say it. Which have? With. With makes it sound like there are some metal atoms that don't have this. Which, ah, which have low electronegativities and few valence electrons. And yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, Jake, but understand all of this is trends and not, yeah. So guys, what does it mean to be delocalized? It means without location, they're spread out. And so guys, when we think about metallic bonding, maybe this is the helpful picture that you saw. The idea is that each one of these uh, atoms is actually bonded to its neighbors via that sea of electrons. The nuclei, the big spheres, are all positively charged. They contain protons, they've lost electrons, um, and then they're floating in the sea of electrons, and these nuclei are diffusely attracted to that sea of electrons. But these electrons are free to move, out, move about throughout the structure, and again, guys, that's what causes metals to be shiny. That, that sea of electrons is very flat. It doesn't have a lot of ridges in it. As a result, light is reflected off of it. It's what allows metals to conduct electricity. You put a current in one end of this and it just comes out the other end because elect current's just electrons and it flows right through. Um, it's what allows metals to be uh, ductile which means you can pull it out like taffy. You stretch a metal and all you're doing is thinning out the sea. It's what makes it malleable. You can bend and smush metal and it's not brittle. It doesn't shatter because the bonds don't have specific locations. So guys, that's everything you need to know about metals. Go ahead. Very little, just this. Yeah, very, very little. I can't even think of the last, there might be one or two multiple choice questions. If you know this, your money. Yeah, there's, it used to be that you had to know, I'm not even gonna show you. You actually had to know the crystalline structures of metals, um, which is all of this stuff. So that's what these things are, where you had to know the face-centered cubic and the rhomboidal and the face-centered bicubic structures of all the metals. Um, they wrote that, thankfully. Actually, even when it was a part of the curriculum, I didn't teach it because none of my students were capable of memorizing it. And it took us like three days and it didn't earn us any points on the test. So I've been skipping this for a decade and they finally wrote it out about six years ago. So yeah, no, that's, that's it. So yeah. Yeah. So like, is that just all wavelengths are all wavelengths of light and cause light to rise and then No, it's no, yeah, interesting. Don't confuse reflected with re-radiated. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. So when you think about re-radiated, you're absorbing a photon and then re-radiating that photon. That's different than reflected. And when we think about reflected, like on the surface of a metal, understand that when the light hits the surface of the metal, the electrons that, that are being interacted with, that's a horrible sentence, but these electrons that are mucking around really aren't constrained in energy levels. And as a result, they don't have the ability to efficiently absorb energy because they don't have quantum states that allow them to promote and then fall. And consequently, that light is actually reflected rather than absorbed and re-radiated. Hits and bounces off. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, I'd never thought about that relative to re-radiation versus reflection, and that's the difference. So, you guys good to go? Is that good?
Okay, so guys, what we're going to do then for the rest of the day is we are going to do a deeper dive into ionic bonding. I really think you're going to find this interesting. It's pretty cool to understand. Um, I should mention this though. You are going to need your books um, and you're going to want them open. Um, open, open, open. This is chapter eight. Yeah. So open to uh, page 293. So just do that now, and then you'll be all ready to go. You guys got it? Okay, so guys, ionic bonding, ready? At the very surface, you understand that ionic bonding is stealing that creates ions that then attract, right? Okay. So Jake sort of primed the pump for us here a little bit with his previous question, and I answered it because it was pertinent to what we're doing, but I think we need to do this again. So guys, consider the reaction that takes place between sodium chlor I'm sorry, between sodium and chlorine. So we've got sodium, which is a metal, with one valence electron. We've got chlorine, which is a non-metal with seven valence electrons. I know that you know how this is going to go down. But guys, when these atoms get together, notice they're in the same period. So which is going to be bigger, the chlorine or the sodium? Sodium's bigger, it's weaker, it's a metal. Chlorine is smaller, it's stronger, it's a non-metal. So what's the chlorine going to do to the sodium? Yeah, but guys, the problem is this. We've always just sort of described it. Watch the screen carefully. We've sort of described it like this, where we've just simply said that the electron transfers from the sodium to the chlorine. And when we think about it that way, it, we, we just see it as some sterile transfer of electrons. Now, guys, what I, what I would propose to you is given what you learned in the last unit, you are prepared to understand so much more than that. So think of it maybe this way, and I don't think you need to write this down, but try this on for size. So guys, we've got the nucleus of a sodium atom, and then we've got the nucleus of a chlorine atom, and these are both in the third energy level. So 1s, well, let's say first, second, third, and let's say first, second, third. And I'm not even going to draw in the core electrons right now, although maybe it would be helpful to remember that there are seven electrons here, and there's just one electron here. But guys, this is where we can engage now because of the last unit. We can think more deeply about what's going on here. So we understand that what happens is, is the sodium loses the electron, right? What does it take in order to get sodium to let go of that electron? Yeah, we've got to add energy, and that's where we're headed with this. But guys, there has got to be an input of energy that kicks that electron out of the sodium. And that's where this is going, so say it again. How much energy does that take? ionization energy. And so literally, guys, we need to promote this electron as we've talked about it in the past unit. We've got to promote that electron to energy level infinity, which is the amount of energy that it takes to remove that electron. Then, guys, when we think about now this electron hanging out free in space, we can now think about this electron joining the, uh, the chlorine atom. But guys, when that electron joins the chlorine atom, what does it do energetically? It releases energy. And guys, how much energy will it release? Well, it's the amount of energy going from energy level infinity down to energy level three. And do you remember when we did that math previously? What is the energy of energy level infinity? zero, and then we can calculate the energy of energy level three, and that would be the amount of energy that is then released from the atom. Does that make sense? Now, guys, here's the interesting question. Do you, do you understand what we've said? So, guys, understand that when we did that, right, we did our equation, which was n is equal to negative r sub h divided by n squared. What element does that work for? 
hydrogen. hydrogen. Good. So now, and you may remember this question was alluded to in the test that we just took. So don't pretend you're not hearing this because you haven't taken the test yet. But uh, so guys, the idea is this. Now you're thinking, wait a second, right? This electron is going into the same energy level. So the amount of energy that it takes to kick it out of energy level three should be the amount of energy that comes out when it falls into energy level three. Why doesn't that logic make sense? Okay. Good. Okay. 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 Right. So which, which, and and so maybe I'm I'm I have no idea what you just said, frankly. But that's fine. Then we're both equally confused. So so guys, let's let's try. <laughs> I love that you're answering the question and you don't know the question. So guys, let's try this. We understand that these aren't the same elements, right? So which one's got the stronger nucleus? The chlorine. So we would expect that the energy that's released by the chlorine would be greater than the energy that is emitted by this. Let me say that. Yeah, so the energy released by the chlorine would be greater than the energy that is required to remove it from sodium because chlorine's nucleus is stronger. Do you understand? Okay. But guys, whether you, under, if nothing else, just understand these aren't the same amounts of energy because the nuclei have different strengths. You see what we're saying? But do understand this, that, that in fact, it does require an input of energy to kick this electron out and there is a release of energy when the electron goes in so the stripping of the electron is endothermic and then the capture of the electron is exothermic does that make sense okay sit on that for a second because you got to get that the stripping of the electron is endo the capture of the electron is exo go ahead Now, and that's where we're headed with this, because you're going to find out something a little bit counterintuitive. We're not going to talk about the why, but you're going to find something counterintuitive that then is going to get satisfied for another reason. So here's why we can't say that universally. Um, if these were in different energy levels, in this particular combination, yes. But understand that if these were in different energy levels, they could have different relative numbers and it could throw off that simple logic. So, but we are going to draw a blanket statement that then's going to be confusing and then we're going to fix it a different way. So, so guys, bottom line is what you need to understand right now is the energies are different, but there's an energy going in to, that's always true. Energy always has to go in to strip the electron. Energy will always be released when the electron is captured. That is always true. Is that okay? Yes. Good. Jake, I'm going to skip you for now because I want to move forward because I, I think every, are you all settled with that idea? Okay, so guys, that's where we're going to go forward. So with that said then, guys, here's the thing you got to understand. When salts form, this, these processes, and this is, this is generic, this is for all of these. When salts form, these processes are not just exothermic, they are crazy exothermic. I'm going to show you a video in a minute. They are way exothermic. So guys, let me show you way exothermic. Sodium metal is heated until it... So guys, what we've got here is we've got a, a, a glass crucible. It's actually Pyrex. And there's a piece of silver, or a piece of, sorry, not silver, sodium. There's a piece of sodium metal in there. And they're heating that up. And as they heat it up, it is giving that sodium initially the energy that's required to do what? Remove some of those electrons. 
Then what they're going to do just begins to burn. is they're going to bury this sodium in a big old graduated cylinder full of chlorine gas. Then it is immersed into the yellow-green chlorine gas. The sodium begins to burn in chlorine with an intense yellow flame. So guys, endo or exothermic? Exo, you can see it, right? This is exothermic. It is giving off energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chlorine is, is, chlorine gas is more dense than air, so it settles to the bottom. Yeah, yep. So guys, you it can produces the white smoke of sodium chloride. But here's the thing that's interesting. We are observing the exothermic reaction of sodium metal with chlorine gas. You're because if we go back of, here, it produces a white... You see that smoke that's coming off? What's the smoke? Table salt. The smoke from this reaction is actually table salt. And you can see all the heat that's being released this is exothermic. Smoke of sodium chloride. We are observing the exothermic reaction of sodium metal with chlorine gas, producing the white solid sodium chloride. Afterwards, the glass spoon contains only white solid sodium chloride. You get the idea? Okay, so now we're convinced that the reaction's exothermic, right? Guys, this is where this gets a little disturbing, and we're not going to pick the pieces apart, but here's the thing that's weird. So we've already established this, right? Sodium losing the electron is endothermic. You told me you were good with that. Energy has to go in to get the electron off. Okay. Then, guys, gaining electrons is exothermic. You good with that? Here's the thing that's weird. Guys, losing the electron as it's stripped off the sodium, tends to be more endothermic than gaining the electron is exothermic. And I know that this is counterintuitive given what we saw. But guys, we're not going to get into why. It has, no, <laughs> we're not going to get into it. You just need to understand this is the case. What I'm realizing is that I probably shouldn't have even done that energy comparison with you at first because it probably was misleading. And we're not going to get into why. But guys, understand that this is actually the case, that sodium losing its electron actually takes in more energy than chlorine releases when it captures the electron. So what we're saying is this, the amount of energy that has to go in to kick the electron out of sodium is greater than the amount of energy that's lost when chlorine captures the electron, which is counterintuitive because we know the entire process is exothermic. So the question becomes this, why is the formation of salt exothermic if more energy goes in to get the electron off the sodium than comes out when chlorine captures that electron. Do you understand the question? You all caught up? Because I'm about to give you the answer. Because the answer is because it doesn't stop here. If this was the end of the picture, that would be it. If forming salt is simply sodium losing electrons and chlorine gaining electrons, then salt formation would be an endothermic process. The reason that it's not is because this is not the end of the line. When salt forms, one sodium does not bond to one chlorine. What do they do instead? They do this. Guys, this is why the energy of formation for salts is actually exothermic. It's because, and the sodiums are gray and the chlorines are green, they really aren't, it's just the accepted convention. Guys, the idea is this. One sodium atom actually does not bond to one chlorine atom. One sodium actually bonds to six chlorine atoms. And then if this were bigger, you would see that each one of the sodiums 
bonds to six chlorines. And you end up with this repeated structure, which we call a lattice. And guys, every single one of these interactions, as it forms, releases energy. So it's not one sodium bonding to one chlorine, it's one sodium bonding to six chlorines and one chlorine bonding to six sodiums. And it's all of those complex interactions each one releasing energy when it forms that causes this net process to be exothermic because the formation of this lattice loses a pant load of energy. Do you get the idea? Does that make sense? That energy, no, 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 that, no. This energy is in the form of enthalpy. It comes out as heat. It is, it's, but it's actually both we experience it as a change in enthalpy because it does in fact release energy in the form of heat. But it, as you're noticing, it is also a decrease in entropy because this is more, this is more, more, less disordered. Yeah, I stumbled on that. It's less disordered. But remember, if it's less disordered, that would not tend towards spontaneity, right? So actually this has got to be so exothermic that it even overcomes, gives free energy, it even overcomes the decrease in disorder, which is significant because this is very ordered. Do you get the idea? So guys, let me show it to you this way. This is actually pretty fascinating. Check this out. I love this energy diagram. Let me step this through, step through this with you. So guys, it goes like this. So right, where am I at? Right here, guys, this was the beginning of the video. And notice they balance the equations. That doesn't matter. But guys, this was the beginning of the video. We had a graduated cylinder full of chlorine gas. We had sodium metal that was in the crucible, right? Then how did this turn into salt? Well, guys, the first thing that had to happen was that the sodium actually has to turn into a gas. How did they do that? They added energy with the Bunsen burner. So that was endothermic. The sodium has to become a gas. Then guys, the other, the next thing that has to happen is this change. Do you see the difference? What is going, we'll call this step, step one, step two, not step, but condition one, condition two, condition three. What's the difference between two and three? Broke apart the chlorine molecules. That is endothermic. In order for chlorine to ionize, it first has to dissociate. So the chlorine atoms have got to break apart. That is also endothermic. Then guys, look at the difference between three and four. That is a huge increase in energy. What's the difference between three and four? Sodium is ionizing. So guys, what does this represent? The ionization energy for sodium. We just strip the electrons off these sodium atoms. So now we have a sodium atom, a free floating electron, and chlorine gas. Then guys, from there, we go down to condition five. So what is condition five? What happened? The electron has been captured by the chlorine. That is an exothermic process. As we said, energy is going down. So now, and you'll notice, guys, as we said, the endothermic process of releasing the, of stripping the electron is greater than the endothermic process of capturing the electron. But now, guys, we've got our ions. And if that were the end of the story, this net change would actually be endothermic. But then, but then what happens? What happens? The, the lattice, lattice forms, forms and, and holy smokes. smokes. Guys, guys, guys a a half half that flame that, that, that you saw, all the, all the energy, energy that was coming, coming out, out, out on that video, that, video, that, that, that energy, energy that, that was released in the sky, sky that's, that's actually, actually the energy, energy of the of sodium, sodium chlorine interacting, interacting and forming and this lattice. And all of that energy that was released causes that change to be exothermic. Do you get the idea? Get idea? Thoughts or Thoughts concerns? Or concerns. So, guys, so, guys, the question, the question then, becomes then becomes this. this. We, understand we understand that these lattice, lattice energies, energies are, are ginormous. ginormous. The thing that 
and HTML through the APA test is what determines how ginormous the lattice energy will be. So guys, so let me get my notes to catch up with me. And then guys, we're going to turn our attention to this table. It's been colored differently, but yours is on page 293. I actually lifted this out of the old uh, copy of the book. So mine's colored differently, but the information is the same. So guys, let's do this. First of all, to understand what lattice energy is, guys, take a look at the numbers that are in this table. What do you notice about all these numbers just right up front? They're huge, but they're all positive. So guys, let's talk about this. All of these numbers are positive, but if you go back here and look at our chart, what should they be? They should be negative. Do you understand why? Guys, this represents a release in energy. And if it's a release in energy, what is delta H? Negative, right? We are in the system. A release of energy should be negative, but if you notice and go over to this table, you'll find out that these are actually all positive. What explains it? What, get, yeah, so go and read it. So guys, look on page 292. See where lattice energy is in bold? Notice what it says. It says, is given by the lattice energy, which is the energy required to completely separate one mole of an ionic compound into its gaseous ions. So guys, with that in mind, do you see what it's saying? Say it again. It's going the opposite way. See guys, what they're saying is that ionization energy is not the amount of energy for the ions to turn into the solid. It's the amount of energy that has to go in to turn the solid into the ions. But why does that work given the way we're thinking about it? It's the same amount of energy, just the sign changes. So guys, the way we think about it is lattice energy is the amount of energy that's released when the lattice forms. The way that they figure this out is they take the lattice and break it apart. But the amount of energy that it takes to break it apart is the same as the amount of energy that's released when it forms. You get the idea? So the quantities are the same, it's just the sign changes. Is that okay? Right. Yep. And it's the same amount of energy that was be released when it's formed. So guys, with that said, allow your eye to scan through the table. You'll notice that this table is put together in a very reasoned, logical order, if you will. So guys, the question is this. What factors influence the stability of a lattice? And you're going to find there's a primary factor and there's a secondary factor. I'm going to let you look at it for a minute. What factors determine the, let's say it this way, what factors determine the stability of the lattice? With the understanding that stability is measured by lattice energy. The more stable the lattice is, the greater the lattice energy will be. More specifically. So yeah, I know you get it. It has to do with which ions, but more specifically. <laughs> Guys, I love your thinking out loud. Keep talking. just dropped my safety backpack, but we're okay. Because heaven knows if things go sideways here at Orm High, that safety backpack could be the difference between life and death. I have no idea. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, guys, you ready? I know that some of you are barking up the right tree, but what I need to do is get everybody to the base of the same tree. So allow me, if you will, to unpack for you the way that they structured this table. So guys, we're going to look at the left-hand side of the table first. And when we do, you'll notice we've got some lithium salts, some sodium salts, some potassium salts, and some cesium salts. So what they have offered to us experimentally is what is called a control, right? They're giving us points of reference. Then they have given us fluorine through iodine, fluorine through iodine, fluorine through bromine, chlorine through iodine. But what do all of those anions have in common? They are all in the seventh group, which makes them what? Halogens. And they are all in order from top to bottom. They didn't give us the same sets each time, but they are progressively in order from top to bottom. So now let's talk top to bottom. As we go down a group, physically what happens to these atoms? They get bigger, right? Now let's look at what that does to the strength of the lattice. So as we go through the lithium salts, what's happening to the stability of the lattice? It's going down. As we go through the sodium salts, what's happening to the stability of the lattice? Going down. As we go through the potassium salts, what's happening? Going down. As we go down through the cesium salts, going down. So what we're seeing is if we keep the cation consistent and if we get different anions, which are progressively getting larger, what is happening to the stability of the salt? It is progressively getting weaker. So guys, why would bigger ions lead to weaker lattices? Go ahead. Mm, I'm not quite comfortable because surface area speaks of this. Guys, why? No, but by moles, it's the same number of stuff. So, guys, why would bigger ions create weaker lattices? There's more space between the nuclei. See, guys, if we came in here and replaced this little bitty chlorine with a big old honking iodine atom, all of a sudden this thing goes Whoa! And the atoms aren't as close together, therefore they can't attract each other as effectively, and you end up with a weaker lattice. It's kind of like if you try to pour concrete, and if the aggregate in your concrete is small little stones or boulders, Concrete with boulders isn't, isn't going to be as strong because it cuts down on the, inner, the, the, the attractive interactions. The smaller the things are, the tighter they can pack and the more effectively they bind together. Get the idea? Okay, but now guys, check this out. What's going on over here? First of all, compare the relative energies. Oh, they're oh, bigger. Yeah, they're bigger. Yeah, they're bigger. But now, guys, look at what's going on. We've got similar relationships, don't we? We've got controls, but now, guys, our controls are the anions. So now let's look at cations. As we go down, these are getting bigger, right? Magnesium to strontium, strontium's bigger, so which one should be weaker, the magnesium or the strontium salt? And in fact, it is. And you'll notice that that plays out here as well. So what we've done is we verified our previous hypothesis. But that's not the way to unpack this. Because guys, you'll notice we are looking at numbers that are significantly greater than our previous values for lattice energy. So now we need to deal with these as groups. So the thought then being, let's think about this is a group, and this is a group, and this is a group. We can understand the trends, but to unpack the other predictor of strength, we need to chunk them together. 
So how is the top group different than the middle group different than the bottom group? It's not a question of size anymore. There's different numbers. There's uh, sort of. You're getting closer. You're, you're getting closer. Let's let Ammon take a swing at this. Go. That's it. Guys, it's the charges of the ions. Magnesium and strontium are plus two. Chlorine's minus one. We have a stronger charge on the ion, therefore greater attraction. Well, does that continue? Well, here, these are, and you know what? Maybe that's a better way to draw this. Let me draw it not above, but to the sides. So here we've got plus twos minus ones. Here we've got plus twos minus twos. Here we've got plus three minus three. As the charges increase, the strength of the lattice increases. But doesn't that just make sense? The greater the charge on the things that make up the lattice, the stronger the lattice will be. But guys, now the question is, which is our major predictor, charge or size? Charge, look at the difference in the strengths. We go from numbers in the hundreds to numbers in the thousands when we start messing around with charge. So guys, charge is the major predictor. So what we need to understand then is that the predictors of strength increase with ionic charge, which is our major predictor, and then they decrease with ionic size. It's an inverse relationship, but that is a minor predictor. You guys good? You okay? Okay, so guys, to wrap up the day, we need to say this. There is a page of notes on this if you wanna read. I'll be honest with you, I skipped this two years ago because it seemed insignificant to me. And then they threw a free response question on the test over this. I was really surprised. You ready for this? Sodium atom, right? When sodium becomes an ion, does it get bigger or smaller? Sodium atom. Okay, what does sodium do with its electrons? Give them away or take them in? Gives it away, right? Can you picture this? So here we go. Sodium atom, 11 protons in the nucleus. We've got one, two, three energy levels, two, eight, and one. There's our one valence electron on sodium. When that one valence electron goes away, oh, oh gosh, sorry, let me do that again. I'm gonna have to start over. So 11 protons, we've got one, two, and three, and then we've got the two, and we've got the eight, and we've got the one, and so guys, when we lose that one valence electron, there it goes, it's now gone. What happened to the size of the atom? It got smaller. So metals, metallic ions, are smaller than their parent atom, right? Okay, so now let's turn this into chlorine. Let's add another energy level, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that would be a chlorine atom. When we add the eighth electron, making this chlorine minus one, what happens to the size of the ion compared to the atom? It gets bigger. Because guys, we did not add a proton to the nucleus, but we did add an electron. That electron repels the other electrons in the third energy level, making the atom slightly bigger. Get the idea? Doesn't that make sense that adding things makes stuff bigger and removing things makes stuff smaller? I know. Although, in chemistry, things do get counterintuitive at times. But guys, that is all. This is all about. You're welcome to read it if you'd like, but I think you understand it. 
Here's your homework.